I'm glad that you came and that you have joined us. And, uh, you know, uh, we've come together to learn God's Word, and we're so happy that you're here to worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, with us this morning. So, who doesn't like a good mystery movie or novel? I mean, we anxiously, we anxiously turn those pages and, and, you know, we wait till the end or we wait till the last scene of the movie to find out who done it. And the mystery, you know, it's never revealed until the end of it. And you think you know the mystery, but it's never revealed until we get to the end of it. And then once you see it at the end, you're like, oh, Man, there were clues all along the way that if I would have just been putting them together, I would have known the secret of the mystery. But that's what a good mystery is. You know, it's something that, that, that we don't know. Well, there are still mysteries in this world today. You know, in the middle of the countryside out in Salisbury, England, there's, a, there's this massive rock formation that we know as Stonehenge. And Stonehenge has been there for about four to five thousand years. And there's about there's about fifty there's about fifty of those big blue stones, and those things are estimated to weigh about fifty tons each. And they came from an area that was about twenty miles away from where that is. And so it's a mystery how, how did these get moved there? The smaller stones, there's still about 48 of those left. And those things only weigh about four tons each. But those things came, were quarried about 120 miles away from there in Wales. How did prehistoric man have the means to move such heavy stuff? How did they get them there? How did they get them stood up? How did they get them into this perfect formation that they wanted? That still to this day is a mystery. Granted, we, we think that we might know how they did it, but how they actually did it is still a mystery to this day. You know, about the same time, four or 5,000 years ago, the Egyptians were doing some rock building themselves. And they were building the Great Pyramids. Now, granted, those rocks are a lot smaller. Each one of the stones that they moved on the Great <coughs> Pyramids only weigh about two and a half tons a piece. But still, how they got those things cut so precise to fit exactly to make those smooth lines on those things, and how they actually got them moved there, and how they placed them in place in prehistoric times is still a mystery to this day how they actually did it. Well, about 2,000 years ago, you know, from maybe 500 B.C. to 500 A.D., there was another group of people that was doing some digging themselves. The Nazca Indians in Peru, what they were doing, though, is they weren't doing stones. They were just out there digging out in the middle of the desert, doing who knows what, and they were only digging about six inches deep. No big deal whatsoever. And nobody ever thought much about the Nazca trails because it was just a bunch of trails that they dug out in the middle of the desert. And in about 1500, two, two explorers come across these trails and they wrote about these trails about how they don't really seem to go anywhere or anything. They just, they're just out there. And then in 1940, an American explorer was flying over the Nazca Desert, and he finally realized these are objects. And they built these over 2,000 years ago. But you see, I mean, the Nazca Desert, by the way, it's not been disturbed in a couple thousand years because it's high elevation and not a whole lot is happening up there environmentally. But there are uh, several hundred objects that are covering about 170 square mile area in the Nazca Desert. The biggest ones here, the big ones, are like 1,200 feet wide. So I mean these are some gigantic, you know, some, some gigantic pictures that are out there. That hummingbird is over 300 feet long. 
And so how these people, now think about this, how these people could actually get this stuff to line up and stuff without being able to see anything overhead. By the way, and who were they writing to? You know, who, who did they make these pictures to? All of this, it's very simple to understand how they made it because they were just digging in the dirt. But how they actually made it all work out like that is still a mystery that people are perplexed about to this very day. So these are just a few of the mysteries that are undeniable. I mean, they're unexplainable in our world. And that's what a good mystery is. It's something that's unexplainable. So the Greek word for mystery is mousteron. Mousteron translated into the English word mystery. And in the Bible, it's used to refer to something that has been hidden in the past. And sometimes God reveals those things to us, though. He reveals what some of these mysteries are. Now, if you think about it in the Old Testament, Daniel, when King Nebuchadnezzar, Daniel was one of the captives that had been carried away down to Babylonia, and the king was having dreams, and nobody could interpret those dreams to him. It was a mystery because he's the only one that knew what these were. And he didn't even know what they were about, though. He could see things, but he couldn't understand it. They were a mystery until God told Daniel what they actually meant. And Daniel's the one who even called them a mystery. He told the king, your dreams are a mystery, but God has revealed it to me. Well, Paul uses the word in a similar manner when he's writing to the Colossians to remind them of the mystery of Christ. Our passage today comes from Colossians uh, chapter 1, verse 24 through Colossians 2, 5. That's where we're going to be at today. So if you brought your Bibles and you go ahead and join us in Colossians, we're going to start off in chapter 1. We'll be going into chapter 2. So in this passage, Paul teaches the Colossians three things about the mystery of Christ. He's going to teach them about the mystery that has it's now been revealed to the saints. He's going to teach them about the riches of the mystery. And then lastly, he's going to teach them the realization of the mystery. So before we begin, let's ask the Lord to bless our time in his word. Please join me in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, as we, as we study your word, Lord, we just pray that you will open our eyes, open our ears and our hearts, Lord. Soften our, 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 our understanding and our knowledge to accept your word, Lord, to, to take it in and to really understand what it means. We pray all this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. 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 All right. So Paul's writing this letter to the believers that are in Colossae to remind them of the truths of Jesus Christ. False teaching and false doctrine were creeping into the church. So Paul counters this false teaching and false doctrine with the truth of Jesus Christ. So last week we studied the first 23 verses of, the, of chapter 1, and Paul laid out, after he gave the greeting and the thanks for the Colossians, he laid out about the preeminence of Christ, that he is preeminent above all things. He is supreme to all things. All things were created by him, and all things were created for him. So, doctrinally, Paul lays out the preeminence of Christ. The portion of scripture that we're going to study today focuses on this mystery of Christ. And Paul's going to be teaching them about doctrine again today, and about this mystery of Christ. So the first thing we're going to see is there in, in verses 24 through 26, Paul teaches them that the mystery of Christ is revealed to the saints. He says there, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's affliction for the sake of his body, that is the church, of which I am a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you, to make the word of God fully known, the mystery of 
hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. So Paul teaches us in these verses that the mystery hidden for ages and generations is now revealed to his saints. But what does that mean that it is now revealed? We see uh, throughout the ages, God has revealed himself and his plan a little bit at a time. He's never revealed the whole thing to, to, to anybody. So after the man, after man was expelled from the Garden of Eden, God was separated from man. I mean, he separated himself from man. And ever since that day, God has been reconciling himself with man, or actually he's been reconciling man to himself through faith. Now, chapter 11 of Hebrews, I want to talk about faith for a second. Chapter 11 of Hebrews is known as the faith chapter. I mean, the author of Hebrews, uh, he gives a number of Old Testament personalities here and how they displayed their faith and how they were commended to God. I mean, he begins with Abel by saying in Hebrews 11, 4, he says, by faith, Abel offered God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous. God commended him by accepting his gifts. So then the author goes on in that chapter, and he talks about Enoch and Noah and Abraham, Isaac and Jacob and, and Sarah and Joseph and Moses and Rahab. And he finishes this chapter about faith by saying... And what more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Japheth, of David and Samuel and the prophets. And all of these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised. So it was never revealed to all these people. All these people had great faith. And they were commended to God. God counted that faith to them as righteousness. But they never got to see the promise. And what was that promise that God was telling them? It was the promise of, of Messiah, of God's chosen one, of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That Christ was promised. You see, because when Adam and Eve sinned there in, in the garden in their disobedience, listen to what God told the serpent. This is what God promised the Messiah the first time. He said to them in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, he said, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. This is God's first re revelation about we will have a Messiah, the promised one, the Christ. So God's solution for sin and the death that came with it was Christ. But that promise was never seen by the Old Testament people. For those who, who, who lived in the Old Testament time, who lived under the dispensation of the law, that promise was never seen or fulfilled, and they couldn't really understand that too much. But in verse 26 there of, of our passage, Paul says that the mystery is now revealed to the saints. So to the people in the New Testament in the time of grace, this mystery of Christ has now been revealed. It was hidden from the Old Testament people. It is understood by the New Testament saints. You can see how it was hidden from the Old Testament people in the story of when, when Philip, the apostle Philip, ran into the eunuch. Out in the middle of the desert, they'd stopped for water and here's what, here's what Acts chapter 8 says about this encounter 
that the apostle Philip has with the eunuch. He says, so Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah, the prophet, and asked, do you understand what you're reading? And he said, how can I, unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. And the eunuch said to Philip, and whom, I ask you, does the prophet say this, about himself or about someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning, with, and beginning with this scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus Christ, about Jesus. The eunuch was reading from Isaiah chapter 53, which is about Christ suffering on the cross. Isaiah had written that hundreds of years before that was ever going to happen. It was prophecy about what was going to happen with Jesus Christ. But you see, here's the thing. The eunuch couldn't understand what he was reading because he had an Old Testament perspective. Christ was still a mystery to them. They could read clearly what we read 2,000 years later and we say, oh yeah, that whole thing in Isaiah 53, that's all about Jesus Christ. That's exactly what happened to Jesus Christ. But with that Old Testament perspective, it was a mystery to him. It was still, it was not revealed to him what this was talking about. You know, it's the same thing with us today. Even today, 2,000 years later, this is still the same about the mystery of Christ being revealed to the saints today. Saints are those who have placed their faith in Jesus Christ. To them, the mystery has been revealed. But to those who have yet to place their faith in Jesus Christ, just like the eunuch, that mystery has not been revealed yet. Listen to what Romans chapter 10 says, kind of going along with this whole thing about it being revealed to people. Romans chapter 10, verses 13 and 14 says, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in whom they have never heard of, of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without somebody preaching? Listen, we all know that we have different spiritual gifts. Not everybody is gifted to preach. Nobody else has your story. There is nobody else in this world who has ever lived the same life that you've lived and experienced the same experiences that you've experienced. Nobody has your story. If you belong to Jesus Christ and you are a saint, then the mystery of Christ has been revealed to you. And your story is what Jesus has done for you. So just like Philip shared with the eunuch, that's what we should be doing with this since it has been revealed to us. We need to share that message with other people. So the next thing that we see in this passage are about the riches of the mystery. Paul writes in Colossians 1, 27 through 29, he says, to them, God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works in me. Now, verse 27, that's a pretty complex verse. I, I got it. But the point that Paul is trying to make in this verse is that the riches of this glorious mystery have become great among the Gentiles. So you got to remember, the Gentiles are non-Jewish people. All non-Jewish people are Gentiles. 
There's only two types of people, Jews and Gentiles. <clears throat> and they've become heirs of the grace of God along with the Jews. And that is part of the riches of this glorious mystery. I mean, Paul called, or, uh, you know, Paul called the, the, the Gentiles sharing in this inheritance with the Jews. He called that a mystery as well when he was writing his letter to the Ephesians. And he said this to them. He said, this mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, sharers together in the promise of Christ Jesus. You see, the Jews have been God's chosen people for 2,000 years. But God never said they were the only chosen ones. This was difficult for the Jews to accept. It was difficult for them to understand. But in verse 27 here, Paul's not teaching necessarily about the mystery of co-inheritance, but rather the mystery that he's teaching here is Christ in us the hope of glory and this is another mystery that just like being co-heirs with the Jews and the Gentiles this is another mystery that is difficult not just for the Jews to accept but even for the Gentiles to accept even for us today to accept this is still hard how can Christ actually dwell inside of us so Jesus taught about the Holy Spirit of, of God filling people who believe in him. I mean, the indwelling is, is actually God's spirit living in the believer. Listen to what Jesus said in John chapter 14. He said, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. So the Holy Spirit, now remember, Jesus is speaking to first century AD Jews prior to the resurrection, so the Holy Spirit was not in them yet. That's why he says, and he will be in you, because there's a time coming when that would happen for them, but it's already happened for us. The riches of, the, of, of, this glorious, of this glorious mystery, Jesus explained this to Nicodemus that one night when they got together. Nicodemus came to see him, and Jesus tells Nicodemus, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So unless you die to yourself and are born again, you cannot be saved or see the kingdom of God, as Jesus would put it there. Christ cannot live inside of a person who has only been born naturally. He can only come and reside in somebody who has been born supernaturally. The riches of the glorious mystery are explained in 2 Corinthians 5.17 where it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ... He is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. <clears throat> when a person places their faith in Jesus, they become a new creation. And they're born again spiritually. This supernatural birth is confirmed by the presence of the Holy Spirit within the believer. Paul explains it to the Ephesians like this. He said, in him also, or in him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire the possession of it to the praise of his glory. You see, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit. You have a hope. Of future glory and that hope is priceless it is the riches of this mystery and the final verses in this passage we're going to start there in chapter 2 
uh, it teaches about the realization of this mystery of Christ. In Colossians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5, Paul writes, For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not seen me face to face, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, to reach all the riches of the fullness of assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ in whom are hidden all, all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. For though I am absent in body, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ. So the realization for the Colossians is there in verse 2 where Paul says, he wants them to reach the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery. Paul wants them to understand and have knowledge of God's mystery. And why do you think that that is important? Why does Paul want them to, to have understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ in us? Well, he answers that down in verse 4 where he says he doesn't want anyone to delude them with plausible arguments. Now, by the way, this brings us back full circle to why we began the letter in the first place. Remember, Epaphras made that journey over a thousand miles to go see Paul because in his church there in, Col in Colossae, they were having false teachings. And false doctrines. And so Paul's wrapping up this doctrinal portion of teaching, which, by the way, the two doctrinal portions there again was the preeminence of Christ that we learned last week, and this week it is that mystery of Christ in us, the hope of future glory. Paul's wrapping that up by saying, I want you to know these things and understand these things because I don't want anybody to be able to give you plausible arguments. And these plausible arguments are things that actually sound pretty good. I mean, they have a point when they make these plausible arguments. It's something that's not like really, really, really far off or far-fetched. But you see, the only way that you can counter plausible arguments is with truth. The truth of Jesus Christ. That is the only way that you can defend against these plausible <clears throat> arguments. And that's why Paul is reminding the Colossian believers about the preeminence of Christ and who Christ is living inside of them. We face a lot of these same situations today. 2,000 years later, we are still facing plausible arguments. I mean, because, by the way, we went over a bunch of these last week. Doesn't it sound good to you that all roads could lead to God? I mean, doesn't that sound good that, hey, kumbaya, we're all going to make it there eventually? I mean, I wish it was that way. But the truth of God, the word of God does not match up with that. So people raise plausible arguments to us all the time about, about our faith. And I want to tell you, anything that is not truth is a lie. Amen. It can't be both truth and a half-truth, because by the way, a half-truth is a full lie. Amen. It's not truth. You can't mix a half-truth or even half of a lie with truth and still come out with any type of truth. It is fully a lie. And this is, this plausible arguments, this has been happening 
since the beginning. Go back to the Garden of Eden with me when Eve is standing there with the serpent. Isn't this what the serpent, and we all know that was Satan, the devil, isn't that what he, the father of lies, did with Eve? He made Eve question God's motive. And he told her that God's motive was that if she ate that fruit, she would be like God, understanding evil and good, good and evil. So Satan didn't attack her and just say, no, God's not real, God's not right, it's not, you know, I'm an atheist and, and that's not happening. He didn't do that. He attacked her by making her question with plausible arguments. It was a plausible <coughs> argument, by the way, that he gave her. How do you know that it's not that God, you know, that, that you won't be like God when you eat that fruit? It was a plausible argument. But the truth of God was, in that day that you eat that fruit, surely you will die. And she did. She died spiritually that day. Her and Adam both did. So these plausible arguments, that's exactly what happens with these plausible arguments. And only by knowing the truth can we fight against these distortions. You know what? And that's why Paul finishes this by commending those people on the firmness of their faith. By the way, as I was thinking about this passage this morning, not part of anything that I've written, it just made me think about the Bereans in the book of Acts. You remember, Paul went into Berea and he preached the gospel to them, and he laid it out to them, to the Jews there, and to the, to the Gentiles. He laid it out to them about Christ. And, and, and he told them from the Old Testament how these prophecies were leading about Jesus Christ and how he would die on the cross. Did the Bereans believe Paul? No. No. The Bereans went home that night, and they got out the scripture and they verified everything that Paul told them is right there in the scripture. And that's how we need to be with the scripture. We need to be like the Bereans. And Paul, that, in that last verse there, he commends them on the firmness of their faith. And that's what he's commending them on is, listen, you already know what the scriptures say and what we have taught you. So stand firm in that faith. So now how should we apply this to our lives then? He showed us three things there that, you know, he revealed that, that it's been revealed to the saints what the riches are and what the realization of that is. We can submit to the truth of God that he has revealed to those who have placed their faith in Christ Jesus. We know the truth. We have the knowledge of Jesus Christ our Savior. You know, Jesus told us that if he left, he would send another advocate to us. Someone exactly, remember we studied that one, and that's what that word meant. Someone exactly like him to live inside of us. We have that revealed to us now. And we understand the riches of that. We understand the riches of the knowledge that goes along with that. We have an eternal hope in Christ Jesus. He said that if he left us, he will come back and get us. And as a down payment for that, because he did leave us, he told us as a down payment, he would leave us the Holy Spirit within inside of us. He he said that that was an earnest. You know, it's like when you put earnest money down on a house. It means I'm coming back. I'm going to come back and get this back from you. The Holy Spirit in us mm -hmm. is an earnest until Amen. we get there. Till we reach final glory, that Holy Spirit resides in us. This is the riches of Christ being in us. 
And then we got the realization of what this means for us to defend our faith. We need to know God's holy word. We need to know exactly what the, what the pages of that Bible says. We need to understand it. We need to know it because when people come to us with plausible arguments, because they do sound good, they really are plausible, we need to be able to defend our position from God's holy word. The pages of the Bible contain truth. <coughs> and that's the only thing that you can defend that with is to know the truth. And I've stood up here and told you all before, don't trust what Steve stands up here and tells you. You need to be like the Bereans. Steve stands here and tells you something. Take those scriptures home with you. Go home and get in your Bible. If, you're not, if you don't have your Bible here with you, take these scriptures home and go get in your Bible and see, did Steve tell me the truth? Or did he tell me one of those half-truths, which is a lie? You go home and, and be like the Bereans. Check this out for yourself. That's the realization of having all of this. And you may be sitting there and saying to yourself, ooh, man, I don't know. I don't think I know the Bible like what, what he's talking about. And, and maybe you're right, but maybe you actually do know a whole lot more than what you think you know. But, but maybe you are right. You know, none of us were ever fully going to know the depths of Scripture. Remember, Hebrews tells us that, that that word of God, it's alive, it's active, it's sharper than a two-edged sword. We're never going to know fully the depths of God's holy word. But we can start today. Today can be that day that you can start and start reading that Bible again and start knowing what God's holy word says. It's never too late to start. Today is a new day. And I just want to encourage you to know God's holy word because that's the realization of all of this. Is that you'll know God's holy word and you'll know the truth of Jesus Christ. I don't know where you're at in your spiritual life right now. I don't know what your relationship is with the Lord Jesus Christ. But I just want you to know this. If you feel like, you know, that, that, that you're needing to take another step with the Lord in your relationship with him, come and talk to me. Let's sit down and, and let's figure out where you're at in your relationship with Christ, where you want to go to, and how you're going to get there. Let's work on this together and, and you know, help each other grow in this. I mean, I, just, I want to encourage you. If you're not part of a small group, get into one of the small groups. You need to be in one of the small groups because that's where we, listen, again, this is a monologue on Sunday mornings and monologues are fine, but man, for a talker like me, I hate sitting in those chairs up there. That's probably why I became a preacher, by the way, because I don't like sitting in those chairs. I want to be the guy talking. Uh, you know what? This is a monologue. You don't get to really give a lot of input today. Come to one of the small groups where we can sit and talk about this stuff, okay? So that's what I want to encourage you guys with. I want to encourage you, you know, to know the truth about Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we do this. We want to thank you for your word, Lord. We thank you for the knowledge that we have in your word, the understanding that we have. Lord, we thank you that we, know, that we can know Jesus Christ. Lord, we just pray as we, as we go throughout this week, you will help us to, 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 to study your word, to know your word, to understand what that word is saying to us. And Lord, we just pray that, that you would help us to apply it to our lives, to take it out there to a hurt and dying world, people who need hope, Lord, people who need Jesus Christ. We just pray that you'll be with us as we go out these doors and we are salt and light in this world. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 All right, if you would please join me and we will. You are